All right. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Psalm 150. If not, as always, it'll be in, on the screen. Or as Pastor Don from the retreat likes to say, it's the Sky Bible. Um, and so we will read together. Psalm 150. Uh, and when you see the uh, words L-O-R-D in capital, for here at our church we read uh, Yahweh, because in Hebrew it's the name of the Lord, the covenants will name Yahweh. So let's read this together. Praise Yahweh, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty expanse, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with harp and lyre, praise him with timbrel and dancing, praise him with stringed instruments and pipe, praise him with loud cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals, let everything that has breath praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we wrap up the summer, uh, and many of you are going into new beginnings for many of you, we have brand new rising sixth graders, we have brand new rising freshmen in high school, we got uh, brand new seniors in high school, you're the top dogs now, we have brand new college students, rising freshmen, and then we have people who are going to be new jobs and all these things. We have a lot of new beginnings coming up in a little bit. And I thought about uh, ways to wrap up this summer, kind of wrap up this series in the Psalms that we've been going through, um, and uh, to encourage you with one kind of final message that you may be able to take to your schools or wherever that you're going to, uh, indeed, that would be helpful to you um, through everything that you go through. And the thing that I came to is this Psalm and this message that I think the Psalm is saying, which is this, click, above all else, praise the Lord. Which if you read the Psalm that we just read, this is the clear-cut message of Psalm 150. In fact, it couldn't be more clear because every praise him in the psalm in Hebrew is in the imperative. It's a command. Praise the Lord. Do it. It's not a suggestion. It is a simple and honest command and a really strong one at that. And it seems if you read the psalm, it seems in it is implying the fact that you shouldn't worry about why because there isn't one stated in the psalm. And rather, again, click, just praise the Lord. It's like the Nike psalm of all the psalms. But if you're reading those words on the screen and you're hearing it from my perspective, I'm pretty sure you'd you'd be able to identify identify that we have one major problem. And that in the world, no matter how old you are, nobody likes to be told what to do. And more importantly, nobody likes it, especially when Christians tell you what to do. There go those stupid Christians again. With all those stupid rules, do this, do that. So uptight about everything that they are. As my kids often do, I'm reminded all the time that we do not like to be told what to do. We, when we hear this song, when we hear it this way, we want to scream, why? Like, why should I praise you? It reminds me of a situation that I had with my kids the other day. I said, okay, everyone, it's my three kids. It's time for alone time. Go do something quiet on your own for a little bit, please. First, the three of them act like they didn't hear me, as if that's possible because my uh, my, uh, voice, as you know, is super loud. But they try to pretend, and so then I go, I said, go. And then as I'm doing so, my oldest, Mason, he's real quick, so he's like, ooh, shoot. Connor's, unfortunately, too lost in his own world to pay attention. He literally doesn't hear me. But Kara, that, that little one, she goes, But I want to stay here, Appa. I want to play with my brothers. Now, so I said to her, Kara, Appa said, Daddy said, it's time for alone time. Don't make me repeat myself one more time. She goes, why? (laughs) Looking at me. I want to play with my brothers. Now, to be clear, I have very good reasons why I want them to have alone time. I'm not just mean, right? It's all about psychology, overstimulation, all that kind of stuff. But also there are situations where a toddler is just going to have to listen to their father or their mother. And so in this case, I said to Kara, Kara, go. If not, you're going to get a man-man spanking. She goes, no, man-man. And then she ran away. (laughs) Just go. Don't ask questions. Just praise the Lord, the psalmist says. And depending on your life right now, your reaction to this is very different. If life is going great, you might say, yes, I agree. Praise Jesus. Praise him for everything that's going amazing. But if it ain't going so well, you're probably saying, why? Give me one good reason, God, why I should praise you. But again, as you go off to your new beginnings for many of you, for some of you, it's just a new week of work. But as you go off to many of your new beginnings, school begins on Wednesday for most of you high schoolers in here. 
Whether life is good, full of excitement, full of anticipation, or life is painful, full of fear, dread, and confusion, I believe that indeed there's a good reason for this unashamed, unabashed command to praise Yahweh, that this is indeed something that we, the church, and the world needs today more than ever before, and indeed that it is very good for us to listen and simply just praise the Lord, no matter how you feel about it. So we're going to read this scripture again, but with a little bit of editing, kind of more in line with, I think, the Hebrew and the thing, and then we're going to dive right in as to why you just praising the Lord might be the thing you need for a really amazing semester and or year. So let's read this again with me, and it will be on the screen. I, I edited it a little bit, um, and then we'll go right into it. So read it together with me. Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Amen. Now it's my job to provide you with reasons why I think just praising the Lord is a good thing. And again, in the world that we live in, it's not the most popular thing that I, as a preacher, could say to you without very much reason. Because indeed, there aren't very many reasons here. But I want to give you three reasons why I think this might be the thing that you need more than anything. The first is, it is the ending. Psalm 150 is the last psalm. If you read it in your Bible, you'll realize that right after this is Proverbs, right? So then Psalm 150 is the glorious finishing touch so an amazing collection of prayers collected over many, many years. Now, interestingly, uh, the thing about Psalm 50, as we uh, briefly touched on this last week for those of you here, the five psalms, Psalm 145, 6, 7, 8, and 9, the five psalms before this are also strictly celebration psalms. All they do is praise God, right? And so Psalm 150 is kind of the conclusion of all of those five praise psalms. Right? Now, more interestingly, I think, the Psalms are divided into five separate books. Like maybe you can look at it as five chapters, chapter one, two, three, four, and five. And at the end of every single one of those books, there is a benediction, a note of praise that happens that I wanted to show you, right? Click. Psalm 41, 13, the end of the first book. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Click. Psalm 72, 19. Blessed be his glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. Amen. Next. Bl Psalm 89, 52. Blessed be Yahweh forever. Amen. Amen. The end of book four. Psalm 106, 48. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen. Praise Yahweh or hallelujah. And then, of course, the last one we just read, Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh. Now, if you look closely at them, or if you go back and read those uh, at some point, you'll notice that all the endings are kind of similar. They have, they have similarities, that one of them always has a similarity with another one, and they're kind of connected in some way, right? And they share this common thread. And what it shows you is that whoever put together the book of Psalms all together, they had a very intentional understanding of the way that they collected and concluded these psalms. And the easiest conclusion you can make is simple. Praising God is the end of the Psalms. It's the way you want to finish. Praising God is the way you want to finish anything that deals with prayer, it's, it seems. The psalmist is not like being, trying to be cute. He's just being very frank and direct. The way you want to end prayer and the Psalms is to praise God. It is the only fitting end. Now you may ask as a smart observer and say, Pastor, so what? Like, just because you're a smart guy and you put together a bunch of stuff and you orchestrate this ending, right, doesn't make it actually right or the best ending, right? And honestly, if I'm just being straight with you, Pastor, my prayers don't end in prayer. They seem to be endless, dead ends that don't ever seem to actually work. It's like I'm calling God, but ain't nobody answering on the other end. But maybe you need to ask yourself, just because right now you can't see a good reason to praise God, doesn't mean that there isn't any reason at all to praise God. There's that song, 10,000 Reasons, and more, I would say, right? Now, I'm not trying to minimize your hurts and your pains. They're real. But the whole of who you are and the whole of the world isn't limited to your own pain right now. Isn't this what we learned throughout Scripture? We have retreat. For those of you that were, we learned through Job's, Job, Job's story. Whoa, Job's story, right? That God's view of the world is so much greater than what you and I think. 
When Job is angry for all the things that are happening in his life, and indeed he wants God to answer him, God doesn't actually answer him. He just says, were you there when I make the stars? Are you there when I put the sun in the sky? Are you there when I do all these things? And the answer is no, because you can't see the world the way that I do, Job. Your life, it's difficult right now. I see that. I know that, God says. But there's a greater glory that you cannot fathom right now. And if you can't trust me, think of all that I have done and I'm doing that will remind you, hopefully, that you can indeed trust me. Could this be, indeed, the reason why the Psalms, or at least this Psalm, indeed, doesn't include any real reason to praise God? That it doesn't even try to attempt the answer, to answer the why question as to why we ought to praise God? Now, I don't think this is God just being pompous and super prideful. But more saying to us, the other 149 psalms and the rest of scripture give us plenty of reason to praise God. And the 150, the very end, is just the call to do it. I think it's almost telling us, don't forget. Don't forget about the cross. Don't forget about the empty grave. Don't forget about the ascension. Don't forget about the promises. Don't forget that indeed there's a new heaven and a new earth that gives us reason to praise God in all seasons. We already have many reasons, do we not? Now, there are reasons to lament. Thanks be to God. And Psalms, the entire book, shows us that we can indeed lament, and thanks be to God for that too. But I think what it's trying to say is that if you spend enough time with God, you will see that there are abundant reasons to praise Him. All over the place. Is this how you see the world in some ways? Eugene Peterson helped me to see this in in a quote, and I'm going to have it on the screen. So it says this. He says, A thoughtful and painstaking promise or process of selecting, arranging, and concluding the Psalms is the exact antithesis to glibness. He's basically saying God isn't adding uh, praise at the end just to be like, okay, let's just praise God. That there's a real reason for it. This is not a word of praise, he says, slapped onto whatever mess we are in at the moment. This crafted conclusion for the Psalms tells us that our prayers are going to end in praise, but that it also, and get this, it's going to take a while. Don't rush it. No matter how much we suffer, no matter how uh, great our doubts are, no matter how angry we get, no matter how many times we've asked in desperation or doubt, how long, God, prayer develops finally into praise. Everything finds its way to the doorstep of praise. Praise is the consummating prayer. It's the end. This is not to say that other prayers are inferior to praise, only that all prayers pursued far enough becomes praise. But you only find that out if you keep on praying. So that's reason number one, that indeed it's the end, and it's the end that should help us. Number two is the where, the who, or the where, the how, and the who. Now I've said to you that indeed this psalm doesn't exactly teach us why we should worship, which is what the other Psalms do, 149 of them. It certainly shows us where we should worship, how we should worship, and who we ought to worship. First, the where, click. Verse one, it says, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty expands. That word sanctuary, interestingly in Hebrew, simply means just the holy. Praise him wherever it is holy, it seems like God is saying, which is everywhere God has made the earth a holy place. That's why you don't have to be at a church or at a temple to worship. But indeed, also, click, praise God also in the expanses, in the heavens. Simply put, what God is saying is praise God everywhere. Everywhere and anywhere you can praise him. You can praise him on the streets of the French quarters in Nola, surrounded by a bunch of drunkards on Bourbon Street, sitting next to a homeless person eating Popeyes, which is what our students did in, Northern, uh, in, in New Orleans. Praise him everywhere and anywhere, it says. Then as God says, here's how you should praise him. Click. Now, there's a bit of debate for this verse, but it says, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent purposes. I have it highlighted there, and that's because those two words or those two phrases in Hebrew are the exact same Hebrew word. And actually, it's most translated in, at, or which, or with. But most Bibles translate it for, or most Bibles translate it according to, because if you, depending on what word you use, it kind of makes a difference. Now, our translation, the NASB, chooses one of both. It's like trying to play both hands, it seems to me. But... If you look at the Hebrew, I think what this this, uh, verse is trying to say is this. Click. Praise him in line with his mighty deeds. Praise him in accordance to his excellent greatness. It's saying when you think about how good God is and how great his deeds are and what he's done, praise him like he deserves it. 
It's like if you go and see an amazing performance. My wife and I watched Hamilton at the Hobby Center. It was amazing. And at the end, everybody stood up and they kept on clapping. And they really, literally couldn't stop clapping because it was so amazing. You clap to the amount that you think the performance is awesome. And what it's saying is you praise God in accordance, in line with, to the degree he deserves his praise. And it's insinuating that it's indeed forever, isn't it? Then the next thing he, they tell us is also then the how, another how, verses 3 through 5, with trumpets, harp, lyre, timbrel, dancing, stringed instruments, pipe, loud cymbals, and resounding cymbals, with literally anything and everything that can make noise and express. Not yet. Too fast. Can you imagine all of those things making sound? For instance, we drum up our mics because it's just too loud without it. But imagine if it was just unfurled and everything was just out to go. That's the kind of praise God wants with every instrument you can think. Winged instruments, winged? Stringed instruments, winds, percussion, dancing, and everything. Now, I know as Koreans, we don't really like to get down and dance too much. Unless, you know, you're in the privacy of your own room with a little bit of music that you turn up that nobody else, you know, knows that you listen to, things like that. But with everything you have, praise Can you imagine the sound that would make if all the people in the world did this and indeed praised God? And lastly, the psalm tells us the who of the praising. Let everything that has breath quit. And to the Hebrews, to the Jews, this meant literally everyone. Not just Israel, click, not, but all the nations. Not just humans, but all of creation and all the heavens and the earth, not just earth. Everything that has breath, all of it, praise Yahweh. Now, John Calvin is a very famous theologian. You can click, and he has this quote that is often repeated. It says that the whole world is the theater for the display of God's glory. This place called earth, the world, and everyone in it and everything in it is indeed the place where you see God's glory and you see it best when his people are praising him. This is what we meant at the retreat by being fully alive or being living, right? Because the reality of the situation is we should be dead. Our sins mean that we should be dead. But somehow we're living, somehow we're doing our thing, and somehow we're praising. Somehow we get to do this thing, and the entire world is where you can see this so clearly that dead people are alive. Broken people are going to be healed. Orphans get to be God's sons and daughters. We're worth God's love somehow. We're fully redeemed somehow. And somehow we get to be at the center of God's own glory and majesty. Because we've been given a gift called the gospel that allows us to live differently than you've ever imagined. The whole world is a theater that displays God's glory everywhere in both the heavens and the earth. All the hosts of heaven, all the angels and all the people of the earth with everything that they got all the time everywhere to the degree that God is great and he is amazing, praise Yahweh. It's an amazing thing to be told to do so because we're not actually supposed to do so. Not according to, or indeed, our own sin. Now the third and final reason, if you click, is a limitless hallelujah. So at this point, many of you probably, because I know many of you, are probably thinking, Pastor, like, that sounds great, and you're using your loud, convincing voice again, and of course, when you do that, people don't like to think, and people just think that what you say is the truth, but if you're really being honest, Pastor, like, you really haven't given us, indeed, a lot to kind of grab onto. Okay, praising God is cool. Yeah, I get it. Okay, how and the who and the why. Okay, that's all good. I get that, sure. But all you're really saying is, you know, my problems aren't that big. Just look at something bigger, that God has reasons for me to praise him, and that's not really all that cool. But I think this reason might be indeed the thing that ties it all up together. Now, as I was preparing for this series of the Psalms in the summer, I always had kind of thought of hoping to finish with this psalm. I didn't think we were going to get here, but indeed we did. And as I was doing so, I read something that fundamentally changed my perspective in ways that I hadn't in a long time. And if you know me, I think I know everything. And so it takes a lot to convince me to change my perspective on anything. And when I read this, it completely shattered what I was thinking. 
So I'm going to give you a little bit of background in terms of what he's talking about, and it's from Eugene Peterson from this book called Answering God, and then I'm going to read it for you. It's kind of long. Stay with me. But indeed, I think it's going to be worth it. Now, in the No, not yet. Sorry. Wait till I say click. Just kidding. Now, before he gets to this long quote, he says this. He says the book, the title of the book, of the entire book of Psalms, interestingly, in the Hebrew and the Greek translation, is called the book of praises, literally. The Psalms is the book of praises. And I won't get into the, all the you know, Greek and all the Hebrew as to why. And interestingly, the word psalms comes from the Greek psalmoi, right, which actually means just song. Psalmoi in Greek means song. So literally this book can just be called praises. And Eugene Peterson has this question that he asks me. He goes, that's an interesting title because if I look, and I said this last week, the majority of the psalms are actually not praises. They're laments. They're sad. They're cries of anger and hurt and pain and all these other things. And so Eugene Peterson, he goes, wait, so does that mean that the book is just like this hoax it's this fake advertisement that indeed everyone thinks it's going to be praised, but it's not. And if we're being honest, if you read through the Psalms, the Psalms make us, even more than we would like to, go deep into the hurts and the pains and the reality of who we are more than any other book, maybe in the entire Bible. And so how is it that this book is going to be called the book of praises when it seems to be the book of lament, hurt, cry, pain, and tears? Is it a trick? And to answer it, this is what he says. And again, it's long, but stay with me as I read it for you. Now you can click. Praises, as a title, is not statistically accurate, but is accurate all the same. It is accurate because accurately, it accurately describes the end, the finished product. All prayer pursued far enough become praise. And we've seen that so far. At least he's told us that so far. Any prayer, no matter how desperate its origin, no matter how angry and fearful the experience it, it traverses, ends up in praise. No matter what it is, it gets there, right? In any, uh, and it does not always get there quickly or easily. The trip can take a lifetime, but at the end is always praise. Praises, in fact, is the only accurate title for the prayer book, for it is the goal that shapes the journey. The end is where we start from. Did you catch that? For the goal, for it is the goal that shapes the journey. The end is where we start from. And then he says this, get this, the end, right, the end of the story, the end of where you're going to be for us has far greater shaping power over our lives than the beginning. That which we are made for is more significant in our development as people than the biology of our making. We are not intricately engineered genetic chips that when programmed correctly make the economy prosper. We are unfinished creatures, ravenously purpose-hungry, alive with possibility. For humans, the future is the most creative and the most essential aspect of time. The Bible spends only a few pages establishing the conditions of our beginning and then several hundred pages cultivating in us a taste for the future, immersing us in a narrative in which the future is always impinging upon the present. What I want to be when I grow up, he says, has far more influence on what I say and do and become than the genetic code I received at my conception. All prayers, by definition then, are directed to God and this aim brings them finally into the presence of God where everything that has breath shall praise the Lord. Basically what he's saying is we like to live our lives only thinking about where we come from, what we've been given, our genetic code and the things that we have. But the psalm teaches us that indeed the thing that's most shapeful of our lives is not where we come from but where we're going. The end to which we will arrive, that God promises that indeed we will arrive. See, the world that we live in Right? And the lives that we want are never going to be exactly as we want them. I think no matter how old you are, you know this to be true. Before we went to the retreat, I asked the counselors, hey, just as a, just a funny question, I said, hey, when would you like to be married and how many kids would you like to have? It was a stupid exercise in many ways because everyone knows in here it's most likely 95% not going to work that way. But it's good to dream, maybe. And most people say it's a stupid question because, again, it's probably not going to happen that way. But Eugene Peterson is telling us that there's something different. You see, because of our sin, life won't go exactly the way that we hope for. Which then means for me that we as people must decide what we are going to do, how we are going to react when things in our life go terribly wrong. When the person you are dating dumps you for no reason or cheats on you for no a good reason and your relationship is over in a flash. 
But for whatever reason, all the work you put in to get into the school and the program that you want doesn't go your way and you got to delay a year or never get there. Or when your parents or somebody that you love contracts a disease and they pass away, leaving you alone, abandoned, with no money and no place to go. No matter what happens in life, it just doesn't get there the way that we want to. And the actual question is, what are we going to do when this actually happens to us? How are we going to react? Now, the good Christians in here will say, I'll pray. And I'll seek God. And perhaps you will indeed pray and seek God and trust. But the more critical question is not that you'll pray and seek God and trust, but for how long? When does the patience run dry? What happens when it doesn't get any better but gets worse? What do you do then? And inevitably in this situation, somebody will tell you, bro, sister, just call it quits. Give up. Let it go. God clearly doesn't care. He clearly isn't listening. And all of this is for nothing. Even if you think God's real, and if he was, then he may be real, but he don't care. And that might be worse, people will say. And I've said this before, maybe you do give up at that time. Cool. And then what, right? What hope do you actually have? I said this last week or many other weeks. I said either you can walk through the valley, death valley, with God or without God. Because there isn't any other choice. It's either alone or with God. But as I continually pondered what Eugene Peterson had said, it dawned on me that when I say that it's better to go through the death valleys with God than without God, that's actually good but it's not good enough. That there's another step that we need to go deeper that I didn't get to that gives us the reason why we need this Psalm 150 to be the ending of all the Psalms and the thing that you need as to where you're going to go this fall. Why just praise Yahweh is indeed a critical thing that you and I need, whether you feel it or not. Now let's be real honest, and I need you to be honest with yourselves. I think most of us in here, at one point or other, maybe even now, Praised God or praise God, prayed to God or pray to God, trusted God or trust God in all honesty because we want something from him. Interestingly, deep inside we know that we alone are not enough to get through this world. We all know deep inside that I alone don't got the answers. I alone don't have all the remedies. I alone don't have the power or the solutions to everything that I'm going to face. I need something bigger and greater than just me and my brain and my know-how. It's why we pray and trust in a God, isn't it? It's why we religions exist in any sort of shape and or form. But as we do, inevitably, as I said, we end up doing which is what the psalm is trying to get us away from. We end up praying, we end up praising, we end up trusting, we end up serving all of it because we want to extract something from God in some way, shape, or form. You want something from God. I want to get here and this is what you're going to give to me so I can get there, God. That's really what we're after, isn't it? If I pray long enough, if I serve long enough, God will protect me from all the crap that everyone else goes through in life. He'll bless me with A, B, and C, whatever A, B, and C are to you. It's as if we're like my kids, and I got the thing that they want. I got the candy bar that they want, and I got it in my hands. And my kids will try as hard as they can to kosha me, to talk to me, to do something to me, to sweet talk me. Carol will give me those beady eyes and say, Daddy, please, I love you. Or maybe like Mason, sometimes he'll try to divert my attention because he's getting older. Maybe in that sense, I'll look away. And while I'm looking away, he'll snatch whatever it is that he wants out of my hand like that. That's what you want from God. Or if I say the right things, he'll say, okay, here, everything you can have, you can have it all. Do it. Get it. Go for it. But the question that we must ask, and I think this psalm is begging to be asked, is, is this why we follow God and trust him and love him? Just so that we have someone to guide us through the death valleys and get us to where we want to go? Because if it is, then you need a reason to praise God at all 
times, which means when you don't have one, you're like, peace, I'm out. But Eugene Peterson says, all prayers are directed to God, which means that the aim, the goal of all prayer, praise, everything that we do is God, which means that the end hope of all of this, the end hope of prayer, the end hope of praise, the end hope of all of it is God himself and nothing else. It's why that John Piper quote that I love, that I quote to you all the time, says, if I could give you everything you want, heaven, all the people you love, all the things you enjoy, all the food, all the exercise, and everything you could possibly ever want from this world, and yet you don't have Jesus, will you take it? Take it one step further. What if I give you all those things and just replace Jesus with something else? Anybody else, will you take it? Is it good enough for you? For many of us, the answer will be yes if we're merely trying to get something from God. And if that's the case, you're not going to get much in all honesty. But if you are after God himself, then the result is totally different. Now get this, and this blew my mind. I told you earlier that this psalm teaches us how to praise, where to praise, and who ought to praise, right? And if you, look, if you think about everything of the descriptions, right? Praise him like this, praise him with this, praise him here, praise him this. I think it can all be summed up by one word, click, which is limitless. Limitless. Where do you worship? Everywhere without limits. As far as your eye can see, as far as your mind can think of, in the earth and in the heavenly places, everywhere, they worship. How do you worship? Without ending, giving praise to God for as great as he is. And how great is he? Limitlessly great. There is no end to how great God is, how big he is. He creates the world by speech. And he dies and rises again. Because he can. How do you worship? With all the instruments of the world, with your body in every way, form, and possible, with as much noise as you can possibly make in a limitless way for all time and for everyone to hear. By who? By everything that has breath. Everyone in a limitless way. You praise in the limitless expanse of the world that God's created. You praise God for his limitless beauty and his limitless glory. And you praise everyone limitlessly, all who has breath. But there's one thing I forgot to mention. That the attention of the psalm isn't actually we, where, or how we praise. But who we are praising. Which is God who can indeed be described by that word as limitless in his glory and his beauty and his power and any other adjective you can give to him except for evil and hurt and pain and shame. When we read this scripture the second time, you notice that instead of praise the Lord, it read hallelujah. It's a word we all know very well. And it's because in the word, in Hebrew, it's literally in the psalm. Instead of praise the Lord, it's hallelujah. And that word in Hebrew is a compound word. You know I love compound words. It's hallelujah. It's a verb to praise. And then Yah is the short form of Yahweh. Praise Yahweh is the command. And the, re- the reason we praise limitlessly is because God himself is limitless. And when we pray, we aren't trying to get things out of God. We're trying to get close to the God himself. When we're trying to get close to God, then we become like the limitless one, limitless in our beauty and our glory and our power and everything that he can give us. You then earn, maybe not sorry, you then get from God a limitless beauty. Which is why all prayers turn to praise. It's why Eugene Peterson says the goal is the thing that shapes the journey and that we start from the end. Because at the end, guess what you get? You get the limitless God in a limitless world with limitless joy and limitless glory. And prayer takes you into that world like, unlike anything else that you know. And when we praise, we get God. But when we get God, we pray. 
in the same section, I won't quote it for you, Eugene Peterson has this little thing. He says in Psalm 13, is this weird psalm where basically people are crying out in pain and anger, like, there's a God, God, why this? God, why this? God, why this? And all of a sudden, without any reason as to anything, nothing has happened, and randomly, at the end of the psalm, it just says, praise God. And then he goes, what? Why? And he says, because in life, you'll find that there are times when you are praying in the midst of the craziest pains, hurts, and confusions of your life. And though nothing ever really happened to change the situation, somehow, some way, for random reasons, it says praise erupts out of your soul. That somehow the act of praying the worst things produces a spring of praise. If you're at the retreat, we saw this. One of our brothers shared during expressions that he actually hates his real-life brother, because of all the things that happened. And though there's supposed to be shame and embarrassment in that statement, we prayed with him. He prayed. And that next day, I watched him praise, hands lifted up, giving everything that he could. And if you know anything about us, I don't ever tell you how to praise. I don't tell you to lift your hands because it's more holy. I don't tell you to do any of that stuff. Why? Because I want it to be authentic. So he, there he was, knowing that he just told the entire group that he has more love for his friends than his actual brother, praising the Lord, erupting. I felt like that was just praise erupting. Why? Because when you pray and draw closer to the limitless God, you become limitless in your praise. It's what happens, and that's what you and I need. Not to think of the reasons why we need to praise him, but it need to be so in awe and surrounded and enraptured by the limitless and amazing God that you spring forth in a limitless praise just because you know it's the appropriate thing to do. When you pray, you don't get things from God, you get God. And when you get God, your life turns to praise. But maybe, just maybe, we're too busy focusing on on all the other things in our life that aren't great, rather than focusing on the one who desires you more than anyone else you could ever fathom. Just praise the Lord the psalmist says, so that you can indeed take yourself away from your pains and into the glorious greatness of our God, and that'll cause you to praise, and you will never regret that, I promise. I want to finish with this quote, again from Eugene Peterson, basically his sermon. He says this, prayer has the element of futurity always in it, pulling us to the region of completion, the region of glory and praise. See, the future is not a blank to be filled in, depending on your mood by either fantasy or horror, but a source of brightness that we await and receive. Our lives are still outstanding, as in it hasn't been lived yet. Our prayers give expression to lives that go far beyond the past and the present to reach into what is promised and prophesied. Oh, church, do we need this? When we pray, we can no longer confine our understanding of ourselves to who we are or who we have been, but we understand ourselves in terms of the possibilities yet to be realized. As St. Paul says, the glory yet to be revealed. Family, that is what we're after. That is why we praise, because we need something bigger than our pain that we're mired in. We need something greater we need our life defined by the glory of God that when he walks into the room, everything changes. Because life without that has no end, has no meaning, has no future, has no direction. But with God, there's a limitless hallelujah. Because Jesus teaches us we can dream a life where death, you can kiss my you-know-what because you ain't got nothing on this. A limitless Praising of Yahweh is what the church, in my opinion, needs more than anything. As I invite the praise team to come up and lead us in songs of worship. Earlier, actually, because John O is leading and he's not actually a part of our church, we're praying that he will be one day. But anyways, that's a whole other point. He led and he didn't listen to my directions. Or none of the praise team backed me up and they sang four songs in the beginning, which is not what's supposed to happen because we don't have time. We're running out of time. But it's so fitting because today is a day where we're just praising the Lord with limitless boundaries. Pastor Don at the retreat talked to us about the ascension of Jesus Christ when he goes into heaven. And he asked this very simple question. He said, why is it? 
of the bumbling and stupid disciples as they were who couldn't get anything right while Jesus was alive, all of a sudden when he left them, they became these warriors, these crazy people for the gospel, dying for the gospel, setting up churches, exploding this thing called Christianity. Why? And I think it's because of this, because they saw the future. They saw the end. They saw what they were going to be doing. They saw the fact that this life that they're living is not the end. There's something greater, a promise and a prophecy of something to come that you and I are living to. So that's the reason why we pray. So church, Regardless of what you're going through, not that it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. I pray that you would come and draw into the presence of our limitless God outside of your, your, your crap, outside of your circumstance, outside of these things. And indeed know that when we pray and when we praise, God meets us in this place and he changes everything about us. And we need that more than anything you can possibly fathom and or imagine. So that wherever you go, whatever you encounter, indeed our heart will say just hallelujah. So that the limitless one can make your little life one without boundary, full of glory and beauty that you cannot fathom on your own. So I'm going to invite you. Normally I ask you to respond, but I don't think there's much responding but just to sing. And we're going to sing these two songs, Life Defined, and when you walk into the room, we've sung them at the retreat a lot, but indeed, this is what it says. I want my life defined by what you have done and where I am going, so that when you walk into any room, you change everything about it, regardless of what's happening in my life, because he indeed is greater. And we pray, we get this God, not something from him, but we get him. My, my children have learned the better thing is to go with daddy so you can get whatever you want than to ask him to bring him, bring them back something. Because when you go with me, it's literally limitless. Because the daddy is the one who has the power, not the things he gives you. So church, will you rise and join me in worship of our endless and limitless God, saying you are the one we praise, brought into the presence of his glory, free to live, free to dance, free to sing, free to pray, free to cry, free to be who you were meant to be. So we pray for us, will you rise, and John and the crew will lead us out in songs of worship and praise. Oh, Father, greater than anything and everything that we've ever imagined and or seen. Help us to not nearly want just something from you, but to want you because you're the one who changes everything. You're the one who changes all the possibilities. You're the one who tells us that we're heading to some place, going somewhere that we cannot fathom and or even think of, but indeed that is real. So just help us to praise you. Yes, we will lament and we will cry out, but in the end, all prayers turn to praise because you are the limitless God and we will offer you our limitless hallelujah from the end to the start. May your name be praised in everything we do. Amen. Join us as we sing in worship.